So here you can see a photogrammetry piece of geo. Um, on the Ningyo we did our own photogrammetry using Autodesk Memento, which is now called Recap. But for this demo I thought it'd be cool that you guys could just use the exact same mesh. So we just pulled one from Megascans. Uh, if you guys don't know Megascans, you should. They're absolutely amazing. And at first we'll just keep this super simple. So we're just going to do the obvious stuff. We're just going to plug in our color maps, our gloss maps. We'll use, uh, even at this point, I'll start blocking in how I want my lights to be since I know that this asset is going to be used on one specific shot. So I want to make sure that I'm look deving it for that one shot. So I try to use as little light sources as possible. I always try to backlight, meaning the light being the furthest uh, away from camera as possible. And usually behind the subject, since there's going to be a wall behind our subject, I'm going to place the light um, from behind three quarters. And uh, I'm just going to start dialing the gloss down one of the tough things about this underwater sequence is the fact that underwater you lose your reflectivity and you, you lose your specular highlights, which is usually what makes something look cool or makes something look realistic. Once you strip all of that stuff out, you end up looking, your, your, your models will end up looking a little flat. So let's just go in and just populate our maps here. We'll plug in our gloss map, make sure spec or reflection maps, gloss maps, all of them are set to raw. And if they look incorrect to you or too bright or too dark, you know, always use your exposure or your color gain. So your color gain will adjust your whites and your color offset would adjust your blacks. So we'll plug in the bump map that was included with this scan. And I was a little disappointed by it. It's an extremely high res map, but when I look at it, it just looks flat to me. And um, even when I crank it up, it just doesn't have the effect that I want. So in this version of um, V-Ray, there's a new texture called the V-Ray Layer Texture. Um, it's an amazing tool. It's still early on. There's a few things I wish they would add to it, like the ability to name the individual layers. But for now, let's just create that, and we'll also create a fractal noise. And we'll increase the repetition so that the detail becomes much finer. That'll give it a bigger sense of scale. Um, and I'll create the first layer and I'll drag that into my texture slot. I'll create another layer and I'll plug in my noise into that. I'll set it to multiply and now if I look up close, I forgot to plug this into the bump, so let's plug that in. So we'll replace the old one, and immediately you see how there's much more complexity on that rock. And that's all I wanted, just more breakup. I'm already thinking about how the light is going to affect this, and I'll bring down the noise so that it doesn't overpower the custom map that was there. You also want to try to avoid something looking too procedural, but it's uh, I use the procedurals as a way of adding more complexity to what's already there. You can see when I turn that off or on, it's a huge difference. One looks like a vinyl toy and the other one has a, a tertiary level of detail that, that I want. Okay. So let's just take a look around. Looks okay for now. This is going to be so obscured by atmosphere that we don't have to be so precise on this. This is the 
boring part of the lecture, so bear with me. I want to be very organized with this, so name everything. That way, further down the pipeline, I'll be able to find whatever I need, including my noise textures and even the layer texture. You could rename these later. I, I believe I do so with this. So let's just name our new shader. It's going to be the sand. So I want to create a secondary shader just to uh, scatter sand on the ledges of the rocks. I don't know how necessary this really was only because the specularity underwater is so similar that I probably could have just pulled this off with just layer texture but I, I wanted to show it anyway because I use this so often um, on stuff that's not underwater. So I'm just plugging in all the maps for the sand. And I'll just drag that on so you can see we have this really ugly mustardy color. And we'll go into our hypershade and replace the 2D placement node and just use a single 2D placement node on every other map that we're going to uh, populate inside of the shader. Since they're all tileable textures here, by adjusting a single node, it'll propagate across our bump, our spec, our gloss, whatever. So you can see we're increasing the scale to 5. I'm trying to see. Uh, what the correct value is. So I'm really close up because sometimes it's hard to gauge the size unless you get really close. I will bring this up. I just want a very high frequency detail here. We'll bring up the reflection a bit. Bring up the exposure just a little bit. So for our bump map, we'll just go in. We're not going to have to do a, a layer texture here. This is already a very noisy map to begin with. I'll actually end up using the normal map instead of the bump map that comes with the Mega Scan Sand Shader. Sorry, Sand Texture. And you can see the 2D placement node is not shared yet so we'll just replace that so again they're all using the same repetition um, I forgot to set the bump map to normal map so let's go back in and swap that to map and tangent space and let's just increase the repetition and we'll uh, bring up the, the bump amount. So let's jump to Mudbox for a bit. For those of you that haven't used it, um, it's an amazing tool. Um, we pretty much, Tran and I, only use Mudbox for everything. You can see the layer systems work just like Photoshop. You have your file size, uh, bit size, so 8-bit RGBA TIFF. We'll select a diffuse map. 
we'll put OK. And you see we could turn it on and off just like Photoshop, lock it. We could lower our opacity and we have um, resolution is always visible on the side. We also have the blending modes on the top right. So we'll turn off fall off based on facing angle, which is like edge masking in Mari. It will mask all the geometry that is at an angle higher than 45 degrees from the angle it's being painted on. So you could see as I very sloppily, that's even the word, paint this down onto the geo, when I turn the geometry forward, when I rotate, you will see that it will not smear across the front face. It will only hit the top edges. So we'll just go in here and scatter this real quick. Um, so the idea is just that through all the years, uh, sand has fallen onto these ledges and the rock will still be uh, clearly visible, but we just want sand on the tops. So let's just keep going in and see what else we could do. And you could be sloppy with this. I mean, ultimately it's how sand falls at the bottom of the ocean. Who really knows? Um, we'll go in, we'll use the eraser tool and just clean up certain areas where uh, the sand is uh, painted on the forward-facing uh, ledges. And again, we could be pretty, pretty sloppy with this. I still have my edge masking turned on. Um, you don't have to when you're erasing, but I, I chose to just leave it on. So that looks pretty good. Let's create another layer. We will bring the layer beneath. We'll set the color to black and we will go down to flood paint layer. So everything will be flooded to black. We'll right click, export channel merged. And we'll export this out as a cliff sand mask and um, Save it as a TIFF file, 8-bit. There's no need for anything higher. And there you go. If we wanted to add a level, another level of complexity, we could go in here and use the dry brush, which is like the cavity brush and ZBrush, um, and it'll just darken up the crevices. Um, I don't necessarily need it for this, but I just wanted to show you how how to get a little bit more complexity if you wanted it. Um, definitely didn't need it for this, but I just wanted to show. Um, so it doesn't feel so contrived or so perfectly clean. It'll just give it another layer of complexity. And since it's, it's ultimately taking seconds to do, might as well just might as well just do it. So we're back inside of Maya. So let's grab a layered shader. Let's name this something else. We'll call this Cliff Rock. We'll open up a 2D texture and we'll load up that mask. So in the blend material, we'll throw the rock into the base material. And let's call this Cliff um, Master for now. Maybe we should call it Cliff Layered. And then we'll throw the sand onto coat material zero. Let's apply that shader onto the geo and see what that looks like. Now it currently has the blend amount to 50% and as I bring that down you'll see the full rock. 
give it a second. So there you go, there's the 100% rock. And as I bring the blend amount all the way forward, we'll see only the sand. Okay. So let's get that 2D texture, load up that mask. and plug it into the blend amount. So now you can see the sand is only on the masked areas. I don't like how saturated it is. Um, I wanna graph this. I'm gonna bring down the bump a little bit. And I do want to go back in and adjust the saturation of the sand. It looks like there's mustard on top. So we'll, we'll tweak that. But you can see the effect is there. You're only getting the sand on the top. Now if this was above surface and we had a strong specularity, we could have certain areas look much more matte and other areas look much uh, glossier, which would give a really nice effect. But again, we're, we have to work with these very flat surfaces in terms of the reflectivity because we're, we're working underwater. So let's graph this for a minute and let's bring down the saturation. So we'll go to our color map that is down here. We'll move some of these guys out of the way. We'll go to remap HSV and we'll plug the color map into the remap and then under saturation we'll just bring this ramp down. So if you bring that down to 0.6 you'll have 60% saturation. And then we have to plug that remap into the diffuse. So it'll go in there, desaturate it, and then reapply it as a color. So you could see that looks much better. We could also go into saturation and bring this all the way up so you could see how you could use this for all kinds of funky effects. Let's bring this back to what we had before, maybe a little bit higher. And you could see if we bring the value down, we could make it almost feel like it's mud or black tar. And we'll bring the value up just so it's a little bit brighter. Again, just to show, we'll leave it at one, but we did leave the saturation down. So that looks pretty good. Let's just spin it around. Let's see how this looks. So let's go back into Mudbox and create this barnacle piece that we could uh, scatter throughout our model. Um, I created a super simple low poly mesh in Maya and we're just using the standard brush, the standard sculpt brush to add some detail here. It's pretty straightforward even if you've never used this program you could do all this process in ZBrush of course so this is not exclusive of course to, to Mudbox. So here we have our high poly model. All the detail is put in. Of course, keep in mind that we're gonna, so this is our UVs here. We're gonna export a normal map. So we'll just go to UVs and maps 
extract texture map and we'll go to first we'll, we'll name this operation in case we have to come back to it and we'll select our level 0 as our low poly model and level 5 which is our highest resolution as our high we'll set this to subdivision not ray casting subdivision will give us a better accuracy ray casting is more let's use more for games um, we'll set the image size we'll, we'll leave it at 1k for now we'll set anti-aliasing to 2x 8-bit is fine we'll turn off preview as normal map or else it'll appear in one of our layers as a bump map so we'll export this out save this out as a TIFF and just press extract so pretty simple we'll select the model step down to level 0 file export selection and we'll export out the model